In the name of Allah, the most beneficent, the most merciful. Editorial about Muharram. This has been compiled by Al Tawheed Islamic Journals. It is found in Volume 2, Number 1, and it was published in Muharram 1405 AH. This is an editorial of Tawheed Journal covering the significance of the month of Muharram, responsibility of the dhakir or the speaker, duty of enjoining good and forbidding evil, and contextualizing the struggle with the current state of the Muslims. The months of Muharram and Safar offer the yearly opportunity to commemorate the martyrdom of Imam Hussein, the son of Ali, and the grandson of the Prophet, peace be with them all. He is the third Imam of the Shia Muslims. This was a commemoration regarding the incident at Karbala on the 10th of Muharram in the year 61 after Hijrah. The tragedy and heroism of the event, the resistance and self-sacrifice of the martyrs, are remembered during these days by the Shia and the Sunnah alike, and by the Shia with a special ardour and fervour and enthusiasm. It would not be an exaggeration to say that the ardour and enthusiasm inspired by the martyrs of Karbala is something unsurpassed in the history of religions. No individual or group in the history of the world has attracted such sustained admiration and love in the hearts of their followers as the martyrs of Karbala, and in particular, the figure of Imam Hussein, the son of Ali, an admiration which has not dwindled in the course of more than 13 and a half centuries that have passed and elapsed since that event. Significance of the month of Muharram for Shia Muslims Mourning ceremonies are held by Muslims throughout Muharram and Safar and in gatherings which are called Majalis. Elegies are recited and sermons are delivered from the mimbar or the pulpit in which the sufferings undergone by Imam Hussein and the members of his household and companions are narrated. For the Shia sect, the majlis and the sermons delivered therein are the primary source of religious education for the children, the illiterate, and even educated adults. However, with the general decline and deterioration in the Muslim Ummah, of which the Shia community is a part of, the great educative potential of the Majlis has slowly eroded, to the extent that not only the great educative purpose that lies behind mourning for Imam Hussein has been forgotten, but rather that the Majlis has become a platform for the intensification of sectarian animosities and propagation of misconceived beliefs that conflict with the spirit of the Islamic faith. With the general decline of the Islamic culture, there has been a parallel deterioration in the educative level of the sermons that are delivered from the pulpit, or the mimbar. The spreading ignorance and inertia of the majlis audience has laid diminishing demands on the learning and capacity of the religious speaker, called Dhakir in India and Pakistan, and Rauze Khan in Iran and Iraq. The lamentable ignorance of the masses and the deplorable negligence or absence of the sense of duty on the part of many Dhakirs have converted most Majalis into mere sources of nourishment, of sectarian conceits and delusions. Shi'ism, which implies a voluntary and aware and conscious choice to shoulder greater responsibility as member of the Ummah and devoted obedience to the Imams of the household of the Prophet, its meaning, unfortunately, has gradually degenerated into a mere emotional attachment for the Ahlul Bayt, peace be with them, devoid of any sense of ethical or social responsibility for the present-day condition of Islam and Muslims. We, the self-declared Shia or followers of Imam Hussein, the son of Imam Ali, should pause and reflect and meditate at the answer given by him to a man who proclaimed to the Imam saying, O son of the Prophet, I am one of your Shia. 
Imam Hussein, peace be with him, replied to him and said, Fear God, and do not make such a claim that God the Almighty should say to you that you lied insolently by making this claim. Indeed, our Shia is one whose heart is free from every kind of deception, adulteration, hatred, malice, and corruption. If you are not such, then rather say, I am one of your admirers and supporters. The Responsibility of the Speaker The Qur'an repeatedly calls its audience to meditate and reflect about its verses and to draw instruction from them. In Surah 4, verse 82, it says, What? Do they not reflect or meditate in the Qur'an? And in Surah 47, verse 24, it says, What? Do they not meditate and reflect in the Qur'an? Or is it that there are some locks upon their hearts? And in Surah 38, verse 29, it says, A book we have sent down to you, it's blessed, so that men of understanding may reflect and ponder its verses, and therefore, Remember, whereas the holy book calls the believers to emulate and follow the way of the Prophet as the sublimest model of humanhood, in this regard, the Quran states in Surah 33 verse 21, You have a good example in God's Messenger, for whoever hopes for God in the last day and remembers God often. It is here that the Dhakir struggles by projecting the Prophet and the Imams, peace be with them all, as supernatural beings to be admired and extolled, not to be obeyed and followed. He strives to drive home the point that the Qur'an is understandable only for God, or the Prophet, or the Imams, and it is a book of sacred and abstruse meanings which are opaque to human understanding. And it is a book so holy that it is impertinent or rude even to try and attempt to understand it. The duty of enjoining good and forbidding evil. The Quran and Hadith both lay great emphasis on the duty of enjoining good and forbidding evil. It is recognized as one of the most important duties of Muslims in general and the ulama or the scholars in particular. Unfortunately, this duty is discreetly shunned by the dhakir or the speaker who is averse to disturb the complacence of his audience and to venture to guide them at the cost of his own popularity and fame. The strategy of connivance, or this willingness to secretly allow or be involved in wrongdoing, though full of perils and troubles in the hereafter, yields immediate returns in this world for them. The strategy of reducing Seemingly, it might be elevating or exaggerating the Imams of the Ahlul Bayt, obedience to whom is obligatory, into holy, inimitable, metaphysical figureheads to be admired and implored in supplications for worldly benefits, may serve to attract applauding crowds, but this does no service to the religion of God and does no justice to the great teachers of humanity whom are, in fact, the Ahlul Bayt, peace be with them. In some cases, the attitude goes further than mere connivance where the speaker tries to soothe and appease bad religious conscience by proving on his own authority that absence of obedience to the commands of the religion of Ahlul Bayt will not hurt the believer so long as he remains their passionate admirer and lover as if such a thing were possible. When such disastrous attitudes are consciously cultivated among the people, when the morning assemblies or the majalis, which were originally instituted to propagate the message of Imam Hussein, are held without paying any attention to Amr bil Ma'roof and Nahi anil Munkar, right, enjoining good and forbidding evil, and to the sublime goals of Imam Hussein, and the sacred purposes behind his resistance against Yazid, it is not strange then that those goals gradually lose their relevance in the Muslim society, and the laws and ahkam should become unimportant and insignificant for the Muslim masses. The Sermon of Imam Hussein, son of Imam Ali, peace be with him. The following Sermon of Imam Hussein, peace be with him, 
was delivered during Muawiyah's reign or governance at the time of Hajj in a gathering of eminent personalities of the period and this not only shows the kind of issues that should be discussed during Hajj but is also a good guideline for sermons which are delivered in Majalis during Muharram and Safar. Imam Hussein peace be with him says, O people, take a lesson from God's warning to his friends through his censure on the rabbis when he says in Surah 5 verse 63, Why do not the rabbis and the priests forbid them from sinful speech and consuming illicit or unlawful gains? Surely evil is what they have been working. And in Surah 5 verses 78 to 79, it says, The faithless among the children of Israel were cursed on the tongue of David and Jesus the son of Mary. That was so because they would disobey and they used to commit transgression. They would not forbid one another from the wrongs that they committed. Surely evil is what they have been doing. Imam Hussein continues and says, God has reproved them because they beheld the open vices and corruption of the oppressors and did not forbid them because of attachment to their favors and fear of what periled them. And hereat God says in Surah 5 verse 44, Do not fear humans, but rather fear me. And he says in Surah 9 verse 71, And the believers, men and women, are protecting friends of one another. They enjoin the right and forbid the wrong, and they establish worship, and they pay the alms, and they obey God and his messenger. As for these, God will have mercy on them. Surely, God is mighty and wise. Imam Hussein then said, God mentions the duty of Amr bil Ma'aruf and Nahi an al Munkar before all other duties because he knows that if it is performed and established in the society, then all other duties, the easy and the difficult, both are established. That is why enjoining the good and forbidding the evil signifies invitation to Islam together with resistance against injustice, opposition to the oppressor, proper division of the public funds and treasure and wealth, collection of alms and their correct distribution. Then you, O company of men, well known for your learning, you who have a good name and are known among the people for your good will, God has given you honor with the people. The illustrious venerate and praise you and the weak respect you. You are preferred by him over whom you have no merit or virtue and over whom you have no power. The deprived seek your intercession in need, and you walk on the road with the majesty of kings and princes. Is it not that you have such honor and dignity because people place their hopes in you to stand for the establishment of the divine duties? If you fail to discharge most of those duties, then you have scorned the duties of leaders. You have forfeited the rights of the weak, though you have obtained your own claims. Neither you had to sacrifice your wealth nor endanger your lives for the sake of him who created you. Nevertheless, you desire that God should put you in the paradise in the neighborhood of his apostles and prophets and you hope to be safe from his punishment. Indeed, I am afraid that you who harbor such hopes from God shall have to taste his vengeance because God had honored you and raised you in station above others for there are many servants of God who are not held in such high esteem as God has granted you among the people. God's covenants are broken before your very eyes, yet you are not dismayed, although you are alarmed if some of your ancestral compacts are endangered, as if the compact of the Messenger of Allah were some insignificant and paltry thing. The blind, the dumb, and the handicapped in towns are without protection and mercy. But you neither act as demanded by your high station, nor care and have regard for one who attends to them. You have made your own life safe and secure by getting along with the oppressors and showing lenience and connivance in regard to their injustices, which God had commanded you to oppose and forbid. And indeed, 
if you understand, the calamity that has befallen you is greater than the one which afflicts the people, because you have failed to safeguard the responsibility of those who understand, of the learned. Since the implementation of the laws and running of the affairs only lies on the shoulders of the men of divine knowledge, they are the custodians of his laws regarding the prohibited and the lawful, or the haram and halal. But you have been wrested of this status, careless, and it was not taken away from you except for your departure from righteousness and on account of your disagreement regarding the way and lifestyle of the Prophet, the Sunnah, after it had been made clear and evident to you, easy to understand. If you had the endurance to put up with the adversities and hardships for the sake of God, the affairs of God would have returned into your hands and your lost authority would have turned to you again. But you allowed the oppressors to take your place and handed over the affairs of God into their hands, that they may act dubiously and indulge in their lusts. They got their authority because of your running away from death, which is inevitable, and due to your love of life, which shall anyhow depart from you. In this fashion, you submitted the weak into their hands to be enslaved and exploited permitting them to run the affairs of the country according to their whims and to make ignominy their way of life through unchecked desires following the perverse and disobedience of the Almighty God. They have appointed a loud-voiced orator for every pulpit in every town and the country lies open and unprotected at their mercy. Their hands are free to do whatever they like and the defenseless people are at the disposal of their mercy. Among them are the merciless tyrants who oppress the weak and men of authority who know neither the creation nor the day of resurrection. It is surprising, and why shouldn't be surprised, when the country is in the hands of a faithless tyrant and the ruler of the believers is one who has no mercy for them. Indeed, God is a judge between us in our disputes and contentions. My God, you know that whatever I have said is not for the sake of rivalry for power, nor for the sake of futile vanities of the world, but because we desire establishment of the landmarks of your religion, reform in your lands, security of your oppressed creatures, and the practice of your commands and the duties laid down by you. And you, O company of the elect of the Ummah, assist us and do us due justice. The oppressors have power over you and they act to extinguish the light of your prophet, peace be with him and his progeny. And God suffices us, and in Him we put our trust. Towards Him do we turn, and towards Him all things shall return. The present situation in the Muslim world is no better than the conditions that prevailed during the later decades of the life of Imam Hussein, son of Imam Ali. All way marks of the Islamic culture have been washed away in the deluge of modern paganism. The greater part of the Muslim world is under direct or indirect domination of non-Muslims. The sad signs described in a prediction of Imam Ali, peace be with him, have already come true, where he has said, a time will come when nothing will remain of the Quran except its script, and nothing of Islam except its name. The mosques in those days will be flourishing with regard to architecture, but it will be desolate with regard to guidance. Those staying in them and those visiting them will be the worst of all on the earth. From them mischief will spring up and towards them all wrong will turn to. If anyone isolates himself from it, they will fling him back towards it. And if anyone hesitates, they will push him towards it. Contextualizing the struggle with the current state of Muslims. In such conditions, how can any discourse about the great struggle of Imam Hussein, peace be with him, be unaccompanied with a discussion of the lamentable condition of the Muslim Ummah? Is it not the height of callousness and even hypocrisy to pass by in silence the aims and ideals for which he took a stand against the regime of Yazid and sacrificed everything? Is it not the very extreme of injustice to deprive the Muslim children and adults of the great potential of the majalis which are held in the memory of Imam Hussein? Is it right not to use the great devotion of the Muslim masses towards the Ahlul Bayt peace be with them 
and their great enthusiasm and zeal during the months of Muharram and Safar, which is a time when the hearts are softened by the stupendous tragedy of Karbala, to receive the teachings of the martyrs who sacrificed their lives with Imam Hussein to inform and educate our children and adults about the laws of the Sharia ah and the akhlaq, the morals, manners, and attitudes of the Ahlul Bayt. The Shia ah have admired Imam Ali and his sons, peace be with them, who are their leaders and guides for centuries, and also have wept over accounts of their sufferings. Is it not time that we should start following them in action and deed in all walks of our life? After all, they are our Imams, our leaders, and our teachers who underwent those sufferings and hardships in order to instruct us and guide us on the straight path of Allah. Should we not question our sincerity if we persist in our refusal to be benefited by their efforts to improve our lot and to purify our souls and to guide our intellects? The Majlis should inform and instruct. It should inspire and enlighten. Like Imam Hussein, the son of Imam Ali, his speaker or the dhakir who occupies the pulpit of Ahlul Bayt should aim at resurrecting the spirit of Islam and the message of the Quran. The majlis should instruct the people in the usul and the laws and ahkam of the sharia ah and the akhlaq of the imams. If the majalis of Imam Hussein, peace be with him, does not help our youths and adults to understand Islam profoundly, who else can stop them from falling into the clutches of deviant philosophical schools and from being swept away by the tide of the ungodly Western culture? Would it not be more beneficial to discuss the great merits of the Ahlul Bayt as ideal human beings and ideal teachers of mankind, instead of just discussing them as metaphysical entities to be revered but not to be obeyed, to be glorified but not to be emulated? to be invoked for assistance in worldly needs and affairs only, and to be ignored in vital matters of our duties, obligations, and responsibilities as Muslims. Only when our majalis become classes for dissemination and spread of the teachings of the Ahlul Bayt, which lie buried in hadith texts, only when our majalis become platforms of Muslims' unity instead of being instruments of division and disunity, only when our majalis and our pulpits become the seats of the duty of enjoining good and forbidding evil, amr bil ma'roof wa nahi anil munkar, and only when the Quran is made again the book of our life and the light of our majalis, only then can it be said that our majalis and our pulpits are doing justice to Imam Hussein, peace be with him, and to the people whom the majalis were originally instituted to nourish spiritually, morally, and intellectually.